There is no way to determine the subject of the first drawing or the melody of the first song or who made them. What is known is that those pioneering artists were experimenting with tools and techniques to create art that no one had ever experienced. Pure creations uninhibited by nostalgia or convention, the quality of the work ultimately inconsequential compared to the value of proving that it can be done. Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the History of- Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com is your source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, which, to be honest, is all things still pop culture now in the 2020s. We are in the future and we shaped it in our own image. 80s movies tees, 80s cartoon tees, video games, superheroes, music, wrestling, holidays. Honestly, it's not even limited to just the 80s. There's plenty of stuff from the 70s, the 90s, and the 2000s that you can wear in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. Heck, my dad is 71 and I got him this G.I. Joe bazooka jersey because he's a big New England Patriots fan. It's something we can enjoy together. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, from Bruce Lee to Napoleon Dynamite, shirts range from soft to, ooh, that's soft. Free worldwide shipping on orders $50 and up. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. This video is about the original 1982 feature film Tron and merchandise related to it. We will touch on things like Tron Legacy and Tron Evolution, but all of that stuff is on our list, the list, to be covered at some point in the future. Tron is a 1982 live action movie about a transcendent being, the one who can bridge two worlds now that their eyes have been opened to the existence of the other, with an inspired soundtrack and cutting edge visual effects. I know, I know, like me, you fell in love with it the first time when it was called Xanadu. It's the early 1980s and video games aren't just a new and exciting form of entertainment, they're also big business, with billions of dollars in sales and merchandising potential. Everyone is trying to secure the rights to the next big thing. NCOM, a giant defense technology corporation, is also developing video games and in fact owns two of the most popular games on the market, Space Paranoids and Matrix Blaster, both purportedly created by Edward Dillinger, who quickly rose to power within the company. Dillinger has also modified an old chess program into a new Master Control Program, or MCP, that not only administers the functions of all the systems at NCOM, but acts as a safety against anyone trying to expose Dillinger's secret. Because Dillinger didn't actually create Space Paranoids, Matrix Blaster, or any of the other games that he claimed he did. Those games were written by another NCOM programmer named Kevin Flynn who was unceremoniously fired before he could prove it. Flynn's determination to hack the mainframe to find the proof in NCOM systems pits him against the ever-evolving artificial intelligence that is the MCP. As Flynn's attempts escalate, the MCP begins to consider more extreme measures to deal with him. Flynn gets help from his ex-girlfriend, Laura Baines, and her boyfriend, Alan Bradley, both of whom are current NCOM employees. They provide Flynn with access to an on-site NCOM workstation so he can attack from the inside, and that's kind of what the MCP was thinking he should do as well. The MCP wants to tip the balance in its own favor by bringing Flynn into the digital world. And it does exactly that by commandeering NCOM's experimental matter, digitizing laser, converting Flynn into code, and placing him on the game grid. Flynn finds himself in a digital reality complete with cities, religion, motorcycles, tanks, and the MCP as an increasingly more powerful, dangerous, and deadly authoritarian ruler. Flynn is going to need help to survive and to take down the MCP and his evil goon, Sark. And he'll get it from Tron, a security program created by Alan Bradley. Tron, the greatest digital warrior who ever lived. But this isn't a game anymore. It's life or death. It's freedom or oppression for the digital world and for ours. Based on a story by Steven Lisberger and Bonnie McBird, Tron was written and directed by Steven Lisberger and released by Disney in 1982. However, the inspiration for the character, the concept, and the visual style go back to the mid-70s. While he was in college, Steven Lisberger and his friends established Lisberger Studios to make animated art for art's sake. Because animation wasn't very popular at the time, and to some it was even considered a rebellious art form. Their first big project was a short film called Cosmic Cartoon that won a Student Academy Award in 1973. Lisberger Studios was doing experimental stuff, friends indulging in the medium, not churning out commercial crap for the suits, but 
It turns out making animation for any reason is super expensive, so at some point, someone's gotta find a suit and get some money. Lisberger Studios began producing more commercial-friendly material. One of their shorts was a yellow neon glowing line art gladiator throwing discs of light that worked perfectly as a portfolio piece for Lisberger Studios and was sold for use as a promo for radio stations. The backlit cell animation aesthetic was something that was already widely used in logos and advertisements, a child of the disco era. This glowing effect is created by layering different positive and negative exposures on top of each other with a spacer between them and a light shining through toward the camera. A simple one color image might require three or four layers. The more colors, the more complex the scene, the more layers you would need to accomplish the effect. The Gladiator short was Lisberger Studios' attempt to create a moving character using that photo exposure process. Based on a drawing by John Norton, the character was named Tron in reference to his electronic appearance. Around the same time, Lisberger saw some samples of computer animation from Magi, one of a handful of companies working with computer-generated images. When Atari released Pong, inspiration hit him like a kiss from a muse after she ran into him on the boardwalk while roller skating. He could see it so clearly, a warrior battling inside a video game, rendered in the electric neon glow. A movie made using new tools to create visuals, to create a world the likes of which no one had ever seen. Tron throwing his yellow discs of light, saving the world Defender of Freedom. Tron, computer animation, video games, all three elements converged into a palpable excitement for Lisberger and his team, but before they could get to that, they had to deliver their current project, Animal Olympics, a two-part series of traditionally animated shorts that tells the story of the first Animal Olympics, to be aired as part of the NBC broadcasts of the 1980 Winter and Summer Olympics. Out front, the team was working on Animal Olympics, but out back, they were working on Tron. Bonnie McBird took the drawing of Tron and wrote the first script, developing Tron into a character. She created Kevin Flynn and Alan Bradley, who was based on Alan Kay, a computer scientist working as a consultant on the film, and eventually the guy she would marry. Alan was the one who suggested to Lisberger to not only try to create the look of computer-generated images within the world of Tron, but to actually use computers to do it, that computers were actually capable of doing it. Mobius designed sets and costumes for the film. He would eventually re-storyboard the entire project as well. Sid Mead designed Sark's ship, the light cycles, tanks, the solar sailor, and the movie logo. Peter Lloyd designed environments, but all three artists would exchange duties and contribute to nearly every element of visual design in some capacity. And things were going fine at first. The Winter Olympics came and went. The Animal Olympics shorts aired. But when the United States boycotted the Summer Olympics due to the USSR's invasion of Afghanistan, the second set of shorts never aired. And suddenly, the entire studio shifted to production on Tron. Animation is expensive. Feature films are even more expensive. Trailblazing artistic feature films made with nascent technology is... Probably even more, nobody knew yet. With a finished script and storyboards in hand and a smattering of computer animation tests to show, Lisberger and producer Donald Kushner went looking for more money. Warner Brothers said no, MGM said no, Columbia Pictures said no. Their last hope was a studio known for animation that was on a streak of animated and live action box office flops. But theoretically, ready to roll the dice on something new and exciting. When Lisberger and Kushner showed up at Walt Disney Pictures, Disney executives were hesitant about giving $10 million to a first-time producer and director working with unproven technology. But Disney was just desperate enough to take the chance. Disney funded a test reel which reassured the studio executives that there was definitely a story here and that, visually, it was fresh and new and unlike anything anyone had seen before. In exchange for financing, Disney also wanted some changes to the script. More emphasis on the religious implications, less on the science, a light-hearted but less comedic Kevin Flynn. While she ultimately liked Jeff Bridges in the role, McBird had written the part with a young Robin Williams in mind. Ultimately, though, all of McBird's original dialogue was removed. Music for Tron was composed by Wendy Carlos, who won an Oscar in 1968 for the album Switch on Bach, classical compositions rendered entirely on a Moog synthesizer, an instrument which she helped Robert Moog develop. Another trailblazing artist creating new art with new tools. Carlos was one of the most important drivers of electronic music in pop culture. She had already composed music for both A Clockwork Orange and The Shining when she was brought in to score Tron. Her music was supplemented with two songs by Journey after Supertramp was unavailable. And Sunday's paper. Enter the world of Tron with a Scott paper, Scott Tron sweepstakes. What can we win? A family vacation for four to Hollywood and Walt Disney Studios, where the new movie Tron was created. Fantastic! And thousands of other prizes, like in television game consoles, plus money-saving coupons. 
and get a free Tron t-shirt iron-on with the purchase of two participating Scott brands. Look for details on the Scott display at participating stores. Kevin Flynn was played by Jeff Bridges after 1976's King Kong, but before 1984's Starman. Alan Bradley and Tron were played by Bruce Boxleitner. Dillinger and Sark were played by David Warner. Laura and Yori were played by Cindy Morgan. While all of them had been in movies prior to Tron, none of them had been in a production like Tron. So much of the visual construction of Tron was done in camera or during post-production, most importantly the CG environments. To utilize the glowing effect created by the layers of positive and negative film exposures, the cast performed in colorless bodysuits on pitch black sound stages. They were forced to use their imaginations to fill in the details of the world around them, reacting to objects, to effects that weren't there. None of them really knew what the world they were playing in looked like until the movie was finished. The production process challenged the cast to treat imaginary, invisible threats as though they were real. Some of them compared it to their experience in traditional stage acting, where there isn't enough budget to create sets or, in some cases, even have props. Along with the giant buildings and light cycles, what they couldn't see at the time was how far ahead of its time this production was. How this was a glimpse into the future of filmmaking, not only with computer-generated imagery, but the degree to which it would require actors to carry the burden of reacting to a world that wasn't there. Tron was originally scheduled for release during the holiday season of 1982. However, Don Bluth's Secret of Nim was scheduled to open earlier that summer. Don Bluth's studio was chock full of former Disney animators, including Bluth, who had recently left Disney during the production of The Fox and the Hound over complaints about Disney's stifling bureaucracy and churn em out process of filmmaking. The last thing Disney wanted was to concede the summer box office to a dozen revenge-motivated moded an revenge animators. That's, That's a, a good one. Revenge-motivated revenge revenge animators. It flows nicely, though, once you say it. Revenge-motivated animators. The last thing Disney wanted was to concede the summer box office to a dozen revenge-motivated animators fresh off their work for the magical-inspired musical Xanadu as they produced their first feature film based on a Newbery Award-winning children's book. They chose to move Tron up to summer and take their chance is against Secret of Nim, Blade Runner, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and Poltergeist. And E.T. Oh, it cost $17 million to make Tron. It took home around $50 million total worldwide. Nice enough, but a disappointment compared to E.T.'s like 800 million. That said, Tron beat out Secret of Nim and ranked as Disney's highest grossing live action film for the next five years. And the additional $70 million in merchandise and related sales didn't hurt either. Tron figures and vehicles were produced by a Japanese toy company called Tomy. Action figures were new for Tomy. They were known for things like wind-up robots, pinball machines, games like Run Yourself Ragged, and activities like the Mighty Men and Monster Maker. For Tron, Tomy released four action figures, Tron, Flynn, Sark, and a Sentry. Inspired by Fisher Price's Adventure People and Kenner's Star Wars, the figures have limited articulation, but are molded in a delicious translucent plastic with brilliant glow-in-the-dark accessories. Each figure is stamped with circuit lines to bring the world of the grid to life. You could pair them with two light cycles, one red and one yellow, each with zip pull cords to launch them across the floor at incredible speeds. They're tough to get in good condition today. The line didn't perform well at the time and never had a Wave 2. However, in 2002, NECA Toys re-released a commemorative set that is almost identical, packed on different blister cards, and slightly less expensive. The novelization of the film was written by Brian Daly and released in 1982. It featured eight pages of full-color images from the movie. Disney released The Art of Tron, written by Michael Bonifer, detailing the production process and a behind-the-scenes look at the visual effects development. Tron was even featured as a 13-week Sunday comic strip. Video games were the genesis of Tron. They were an integral part of the narrative, the visual language, the sound design. There's no way there aren't games in and about the movie. One of the first was from Tomy in 1981, a handheld or tabletop electronic game with three different modes drawing inspiration from the light cycles, disc combat, and the final fight against the MCP. Some of the other notable games were Tron, the stand-up arcade unit in 1982, was developed and released by Bally Midway Games. It featured four different mini-games based on different moments in the film. Light Cycles, Battle Tanks, IO Tower, where the player has to fight against swarms of grid bugs to enter the communications tower, and the final battle with the MCP. The cabinet had black lights integrated into the design, causing the player's clothing to glow as they approached it, as they were drawn to it, immersing the player in a gaming experience that blurred the line with reality and the film. It would earn roughly $45 million in quarters, which is, it's, uh, I'm not sure how to do the math here. $45 million in quarters. Do you, do you divide by four? Do you multiply by four? Regardless, that was more money than the movie made. 
Mattel released Tron Deadly Discs, Tron Mazatron, and Tron Solar Sailor to their Intellivision console. Deadly Discs was also released on the Atari 2600. Tron Mazatron was re-released on the Intellivision and the Atari 2600, renamed Adventures of Tron. Some of the other merchandise released in the marketing extravaganza included a vinyl version of the Wendy Carlos score and sound effects from the movie, which was good because until the 20th anniversary, you couldn't get it on CD. The original master tapes were so degraded by the time CDs were being produced that they had to wait for technology to be invented to clean them up. Storybooks, trading cards, puzzles, posters, read-along adventures, pop-up books, Disney put the full push into promoting the film. In a post-Star Wars world, nothing less would suffice. From 1982 to 1995, Disneyland's People Mover was a Tron-themed attraction. People Mover through the world of Tron cast visitors' tram as a light cycle as they traveled through a tunnel. Math is hard, but for some reason Tron was considered a disappointment by Disney. Lisberger credits the underperformance to a genuine unease by movie studios, by animators, by audiences that computers were a looming threat to the creative talents of humans. And Tron was proof that one day computers could take over the arts like they were beginning to take over science and manufacturing. You're right. It's fact. You're right. You were right. It happened. You're right. It happened. This one took place. Roger Ebert called Tron a dazzling movie from Disney in which computers have been used to make themselves romantic and glamorous. Here's a technological sound and light show that is sensational and brainy, stylish and fun. However, Variety Magazine referred to it as loaded with visual delights but falls way short of the mark in story and viewer involvement. Screenwriter-director Steven Lisberger has adequately marshaled a huge force of technicians to deliver the dazzle, but even kids, and specifically computer game geeks, will have a difficult time getting hooked on the situations. Tron couldn't qualify to win a special effects Oscar because the Academy wouldn't nominate it out of a sense that the production had somehow cheated by using computers. As if they just opened a file that said movie backgrounds and hit print to screen. Tron's visual effects supervisor, Harrison Ellenshaw, spoke about the Motion Picture Academy, saying, Let's say I was disappointed. They didn't understand it. They weren't comfortable with it. They begrudged the fact that it looked so unique. Sometimes you can't do too much out of the comfort zone. Tron was released on VHS, Betamax, Laserdisc, and Videodisc in 1983. The frame was cropped to fit square televisions and wasn't restored to widescreen until the Archive Collection box set released in the 1990s. In 2011, it was released as a special edition DVD and Blu-ray as part of the marketing rollout for the home media release of the sequel film Tron Legacy. You can also buy Tron from just about every streaming service that's out there, or stream it on Disney+. Disney's disappointment with Tron at the box office stopped any immediate sequel film or television plans. It would be more than 20 years in 2003 before a PC game called Tron 2.0 would attempt to carry on the mythology. It features Alan Bradley, voiced by Bruce Boxleitner, and his son Jet Bradley, who finds himself thrust into the digital realm. It's a first-person shooter that challenges you, the user, to guide Jet in his fight against an evil computer virus. The question is, is it canon? No! According to Tron creator Steven Lisberger, it is not part of the Tron mythology. That honor would fall to 2010's Tron Legacy, which sees Boxleitner's Alan Bradley and Bridges' Kevin Flynn return decades later to help Flynn's son Sam fight for freedom on the grid and in the real world. Tron The Next Day is a 10-minute short included with the DVD release of Tron Legacy starring Boxleitner as Tron and examines the immediate implications of the literal next days after Tron Legacy ends. Definitely felt like a setup for something going forward, however... The next release was Tron Uprising, a 19-episode animated series released in 2012 that takes place between the events of the original Tron and the sequel Tron Legacy that helps establish the state of the grid after the audience has been away for nearly 30 years. If Tron Legacy and Uprising did nothing else, they re-cemented the neon light-piped aesthetic as a signature visual of the original film. In 2020, Garth Davis was announced as the director for a third Tron feature film with a script written by Jesse Wigutow. IMDb currently lists David DiGiglio as a writer, with characters by Steven Lisberger and Bonnie McBird. Jared Leto is attached as both a main character and a co-producer alongside Justin Springer and Emma Ludbrook. There is currently no title, release date, or any other information. Tron has transcended generations thanks to nostalgia, licensing, and technology that didn't exist when the film was originally released. In 2002, Metacom released a series of Tron figures and light cycles as part of their 4-inch Real Action Heroes line. In 2005, the world of the grid and Tron himself appeared in the Disney Final Fantasy crossover game Kingdom Hearts 2. Kids who had never seen the movie met Tron for the first time alongside classic Disney characters like Goofy and Kingdom Hearts regulars like Sora. 
Over the years, Disney has licensed Tron characters and branding out for all kinds of collectibles. From Funko Pops and Dorbs to Diamond Select Mini Mates and modern 7-inch figures and regular and translucent, statues, belt buckles, apparel, all based on the original 1982 film. The internet itself gave birth to Tron Guy. Jay Maynard was a Tron fan who, in 2004, made his own Tron suit to cosplay at a convention. He posted pictures on his website, the internet found it, and he became notorious for that. He shows up in an episode of South Park and was on America's Got Talent. The internet is dumb. And I just remembered that I've been listening to both the Tron and Tron Legacy soundtracks while writing Toy Galaxy scripts for years. Imagine Anthem by Wendy Carlos playing while I say this line, so much more dramatic and ethereal. Tron wasn't the first to use CG in a movie, but it was the first to use it the way they used it, to the extent that they used it, and to tell a story so tied to the creation and implementation of it, using computers to tell a story about computers. Lisberger and his staff were doing things that technology had not yet been invented for. They were working with computers that maxed out at 2 megabytes of RAM and 330 megs of storage. They had to develop cheats like allowing things to fade out into the distance to save time and resources, tricks that would be used in video games for the next two decades. Tron set the foundation for making a movie with so much of the world left to be created after the cameras stopped rolling. Techniques that were being invented on the set of Tron are now commonplace. Movie franchises like Star Wars and the Marvel Universe were made with the same techniques 30 years later. The smooth, clean, plastic world of Tron was a result of the limits of the tools, but it made sense to the story. It was a fresh, new, clean world, ready for exploration, for storytelling, with a horizon that literally stretched to infinity. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you haven't heard, we started streaming on Twitch. Find us at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon or become a YouTube channel member. Thanks again to 80s Tees for sponsoring this video. You can order this shirt today if you want. Let us know in the comments down below how you'd rank the Tron movies and the movies that inspired Tron. Keep it simple, Tron, The Matrix, Xanadu. It's a tough call for me. I really like all three movies, but for different reasons. But I'm on the spot and have to make a call. I'm going to go Tron 1, The Matrix 2, Xanadu 3. Greg, I know yours is the same answers as mine, so you don't have to even say anything. Just say cut. <laughs> cut.